Now, I love the English language, really I do, but there are a bunch of things that other languages do better, like for example, giving you a built-in compass or making everyone prove the things that they say to you. And there is one thing that is so insanely fun that's missing from English that it will make you want to throw away your cell phone when you know what it is. But before you do that, next time someone's mad at you and they say, I have no words, perhaps you could suggest that they learn Russian or Czech. These are just two of the many languages that have more words for emotions than English does, which is really quite efficient when you just want to nail your meaning succinctly. Like this Czech word, for example, litost. Imagine you're feeling terrible regret for something. Now throw in some grief and humiliation. In fact, let's say you're in absolute torment at the sight of your own misery. Well, that is litost. English has the emotion, of course, we all do, but not the word. Man, we really need words like this so that we can quit having to explain every mood in full sentences or long YouTube videos, right? And then I love this Arabic word, tarab. It is a happy one this time. You know that feeling when you get completely swept away by a song and you lose your inhibitions? Well, tarab describes the emotional effect of music, like a musically induced euphoria or state of ecstasy. Beautiful, but see how long it took me to explain that in English? Well, here are some of my other favorite untranslatable words. Now, if I knock on your door all excited and I say, hey, guess what? We're going to go skiing in St. Moritz next month. How will you know that you are included? I mean, I could be talking about me and you going skiing. We're going skiing. But maybe I'm talking about me and someone else. I'm just telling you about it. I could also be talking about me and a whole group of people that may or may not include you. Well, unlike English, some languages differentiate between the inclusive we and the exclusive we. Tagalog, for example, does it with these two words, and many other languages have this feature too, but you will notice that there are no Western European languages there. Now, Maori does it even better. In Maori, there is a word meaning you and I, a word meaning me and him or her, but not you. A word for all of us and a word for me and all of them, but not you, which is pretty cool. I mean, Maoris can just avoid all these embarrassing misunderstandings. If you've ever been to Thailand, you would probably know that hello sounds something like this. Sawadee Sawadee Hear the way that the ka rises down like that? Well, languages like Thai, Mandarin, Cherokee use different tones in their speech to convey meaning, which is super useful for words that look or sound identical, but mean different things. Like the Thai word mai, for example, it has five meanings, but each is said with a slightly different tone. Mai, 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 mai. Does English have this? No, it doesn't. And if it did, we'd have less explaining to do perhaps. In other languages like Japanese, it's not tones, but pitch that's more important. The intonation falls only on specific syllables rather than the whole word. For example, if I take the word hashi, which means chopsticks, and I were to change that first sound from an H sound to a K sound into the word kashi, that would completely change the word, right? It would go from the word for chopsticks into the word that means lyrics. And in the same way, if I change the melody that I pronounce hashi with from hashi to hashi, that completely changes what word I'm saying. Now, instead of saying the word for chopsticks, I'm saying the word for bridge. If you want to sound native, the pitch tone of each syllable is critical to conveying its meaning. I mean, wouldn't this be nice to have in English? Would it? I don't know. But if you are British, as an equivalency, just think of those 441 homophones that we have right there. Mind you, if we added tones to that, it would make English an absolute nightmare for foreign students. I mean, take the word set, for example. Set, a simple word, has 430 definitions. Do we really need any more nuance? Remember that time that your friend asked you, I know you like her, but do you like like her? That is reduplication, that like-like thing. It's also not proper English, of course, but so useful, right? Forever, 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 ever, forever, ever. For us, it's just creative wordplay, but many languages use reduplication for real, real. Saying something twice or more intensifies and changes the meaning. Like in Italian, you say piano, piano for very quietly. And Hebrew, I don't speak Hebrew, but see for yourself. Even better, in many languages, reduplication creates the plural, like Malay, for example. If 
Did you try those out? They are super fun. There is even a Micronesian language that has triplication. That's three. English speakers desperately want reduplication, so can someone just please add it to our grammar rulebook, please? Meantime, if you want to practice doing things in three, then here's something you can practice. You like, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications. That's triplication right there. Have a listen to this quick exchange. Is she not going out tonight? Yes. So, is that a yes, she is going out, or no, she isn't going out? Think about it, you can't really be certain, can you? In English, we usually use yes, no questions to check something we believe or expect to be true. Aren't you hungry? Isn't she coming? Hear that? I'm asking a positive question, but using a negative form. Tag questions, as in they have a similar positive negative format. You can come, can't you? Can, can't? It might sound normal to you, but ask a room full of English students if this is easy to understand. Finnish and the Celtic languages do this a little bit better. They have what's called an echo response. So instead of answering a yes or no question with, well, yes or no, you simply echo the verb. Question, aren't you hungry? Answer, I'm hungry, or I'm not hungry. Think about the question, you don't avoid paying taxes? Sounds a bit ambiguous in English, right? But in Welsh, you just answer, I do not. Problem solved. Japanese is an interesting case where it doesn't really have exact words in the same way as English does for yes and no, rather this agreement. So question, are you not going? Answer, that's right, I'm not going. If you can add fabric softener to your clothes, then why not add word softener to your words? In Thailand, there is a very simple way to do this. If you are a woman, you end your sentences with ka, and if you're a man, it's krab. And then now, straight away, you are being polite. You can also use the particle na in situations where you need to be very assertive but don't want to come across as too demanding. Like if you tell someone, wait a moment, you see that little nakrab at the end? That makes it all soft and silky. Japanese society values hierarchy very much and they take politeness to the next level with their honorific system. It's pretty simple, really. It's just a matter of adding a suffix after someone's name. San, sama, kun. Chan. But what an easy way to show someone that you just respect them, at least, once you've learned the right titles to use, of course. And let's not forget the Romance languages, all of which give you two options for the pronoun you. Like Spanish, you have tu and usted. In French, tu and vous. And in English, on the other hand, you are forced to call everybody you. Your boss, the girly fancy, your best friend's great-grandmother, everyone is just you. It's so rude, English. Imagine if you could turn any statement into a question just by adding a tiny spoken marker at the start or the end. No need to rearrange the words at all. So, in English, Christy has dark hair becomes does Christy have dark hair if you turn it into a question. You have to rearrange a whole bunch of stuff. But Polish keeps things simple. Don't rearrange the words, just add this particle in front. One could argue that we can do this in English, but it sounds a little bit clumsy and not very native-like. Mandarin has a super easy way to make simple queries. All you do is put the n particle after the thing that you want to ask about. Very useful for bounce-back questions, especially as a learner with limited vocabulary. Say someone is talking about, I don't know, climate change, but you don't know much about the topic. You can just say one word, like Amazon, and then add this particle n at the end to create the question. The copula versus the locative or locative B. There's a couple of big words in there. Pretty simple though. We're talking about multiple forms of the verb to be. For example, Portuguese has ser and estar, which helps to make it crystal clear whether something is, on a simple level, temporary or permanent. In English though, there is no distinction between I am being, I am doing, or I am at. I am a dancer, that's something permanent, it's what I am, but I am dancing or I am at the dance. These are temporary. So why is there just one I am in English? Irish, on the other hand, has two words for I am. You have tor and is. I am a dancer looks like this, but I am at the dance looks like this. You following what I'm saying? What do you think? Would you like to have this ability in English? It would be quite handy. There's an even better one coming up at the end because, you know, as always, I tend to save the best till last. Now, where were we? It's raining. But what exactly is it. This is something peculiar to English. Italian doesn't do this. Italian doesn't say it. It just drops the it and uses the verb by itself. Piove. It's raining. You can do the same with other weather words, or you can use it to do things like it's not fair, or it seems you've forgotten your manners. Who or what exactly is it? Well, 
That is a subject for another day. But just like Italian, many other languages are null subject and allow you to drop the it or any other subject pronoun for that matter. The subject is coded into the verb conjugation. So you can just get straight to the point. Snowing. Look how simple it is with Arabic too. Help other helps you. By the way, if you're enjoying learning about language and language learning, then you might like to join my email newsletter. I send regular tips about language learning out to around 100,000 people each week. It is completely free and it's a great way to bring a bit of regular culture and inspiration into your life, along with, of course, tips to help you become a more confident language learner. I'll put a link in the description to the newsletter so that you can sign up. It's completely free. This strikes me as a feature that all languages should have. Anytime you say that something happened, you have to also say whether you witnessed it or not, because the seeing part is encoded with the other words, which could mean the end of this. No, who drew our mummy's mirror? I don't know. Was it you? No. Who was it? A Batman. <laughs> Batman. Yep, some languages have markers that attach to the end of seeing words. Did you see it with your own eyes? Did you hear it? Perhaps you just assumed it. Well, there are proof categories to cover it all, then have a look. So you, can, you can't just blame it on Batman here without adding yet another lie that you personally witnessed Batman doing it. Many of these languages are in the Amazon basin. For example, there is the Tadiana language. Apparently there are many ways to tell someone, for example, that uh, José played football. Have a look. And don't be tempted to leave out that evidential bit at the end because you will look pretty silly. It will come out as ungrammatical and a very highly unnatural sentence. In English, every time you describe something that happened or will happen, you automatically give away the time frame, you know, whether it's past, present, future, or continuous, because you have to use tense, right? So for example, I made a video, I'm making a video, I will make a video. Tense is the location of a word in time, and the verb always conjugates to give away this time location. But what if you want to be vague and avoid putting an action into any space in time? Well, you can try, but it's impossible in English. Chinese, on the other hand, lets you use verbs without conjugating them at all, since the verb only has one form. Speaking of tenses, the Kikuyu language of Kenya is amazingly precise. Check out these conjugations here. Notice there are three tenses for was dancing, depending on how long ago it actually happened. I mean, think about this. A language so rich with tenses must make explaining things pretty easy. How good are your navigational skills? Well, if you spoke this Aboriginal language from Australia, you'd have no words for left, right, forward, and back. No words. But you would be really good at using what are called cardinal directions, and north, south, east, west, and everything in between. Hey man, can you tell me which way the beach is? Yeah, it's to the west, but from here you'll start off west, northwest, turn southwest at the bend, and then head west on the dirt track. Sound hard? Well, in this language, north, south, east, and west combine with prefixes and suffixes to form dozens of new words that give very precise directions. In fact, a single direction word can even tell you the things like distance to your location and its proximity to nearby landmarks. Those guys probably never get lost. But what do you think? Should we put Google Maps out of business and adopt this in English? Now, the synthetic future tense is something that will be obvious once you've heard it. There are no single English verbs verbs, mind, to describe something that will happen in the future. Go on, try and think of one. In Spanish, you can say, for example, cantará, meaning I will sing. Or in Italian, parlerò, meaning I will speak. But in English, you have to add another verb called an auxiliary verb to the main one. Will sing, am going, will fly. I, I will be writing new books this year. Happens to be true. That will be writing in Italian is just one word, scriverò. See, the Romance languages have an inflectional or synthetic future tense where you just add something on the end of a word to make the future tense. It's pretty handy. You may have noticed by now that English uses far more words to get its meaning across than so many other languages do, and we are not done yet. Every kid ever has heard this from a parent or teacher at some stage. One at a time, please. One at a time, please. Five words. But teachers in Japan, Turkey, and Georgia can say this with just one word. Hitorizutsu. 
that's Japanese for one person at a time. And in Turkish, you just add a suffix to the number word. Even Latin has this feature. 100 each, for example, is kenteni. These are called distributive numerals, and they are useful words that answer how many times each or how many at a time. In English, the only distributive number words are very rare ones, like singly and doubly, and using them is going to make you sound a little bit weird, but you know, hey, <laughs> don't let me stop you. Now, what about that feature missing from English that you can't use in a text message? Do you ever get lost when you're out hiking in the mountains with no phone reception? Well, you are going to wish that you could do this with English. <laughs> From the Amazon to the Bering Strait, there are 70 places on Earth, seven zero, 70 places where entire languages can be whistled. I'm talking full sentences with syllables, intonation, vowel sound, basically a whistle version of the spoken language. And people communicate like this every day of their lives. So there are many things that English cannot do, and even the things it can do can be incredibly hard to learn. In fact, in this video, I will tell you 10 reasons why English is ridiculously hard. And you will notice that I'm wearing exactly the same t-shirt in that video too, which is an ingenious and totally deliberate way of creating a seamless viewer experience.